Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you here again. And uh, this lesson, um, I think, would be one that we're all familiar with, but we're going to try to bring out some new, um, some new things about it, maybe think about it differently, see how we can apply this lesson about Jonah to our own lives. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. No, I'm not gonna begin by sharing my screen. I'm gonna begin with prayer. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the scriptures. And especially thank you for this story of Jonah that has so many implications for us today. Open our minds, open our hearts that we can understand what you want us to get from this lesson and help us to get it, to apply it, and then determine to maybe make some changes to do something special because we were here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we will share the screen and go into the lesson. And I'm wondering what's going on and why. Okay. Okay, got it. This lesson is entitled The Restless Prophet. Now, um, by now, we're almost at the end of the quarter. Next week is our last week in this quarter. So we should really have gotten that concept that as we study in this lesson, the word rest is synonymous with peace because our bodies can rest but our minds might not be able to rest because we're thinking about something. We're worried about something, you know, cast our cares upon the Lord. Um, we just saw something from the large group, you know, cast that thing. So this restless prophet is Jonah. And he has a hard time being at peace with what God has asked him to do. And so let's um, get into the lesson. In the memory verse <clears throat> coming from Jonah 4.11. And should I not pity Nineveh? The person who's talking, the I in this passage is God. And should I, God, not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? In other words, these people are kind of ignorant about some stuff. And shouldn't I pity them? And much livestock. Now, I have to say in this lesson, um, as I studied and as I researched, was trying to get the connection of that and much livestock, how that fits into what's going on in the lesson. And there is a place where the livestock um, come into the lesson. So be thinking about why was and much livestock <laughs> added right there. And we'll talk about it when we get to that. Jesus himself, referred to the story of Jonah. So while Jonah is in the Old Testament, Jesus refers to it. And you probably noticed something about me as the facilitator of this class. I always like to connect the Old Testament with the New Testament because there's so many people who wanna say, well, that was in the Old Testament. You know, we have a new covenant. We know what that means, too. We won't go into it. But there's so many people who want to say things that happen in the Old Testament are not relevant. 
But when we see in the New Testament, Jesus referring to things, and there are a lot of, lot of um, passages, scriptures, stories. There are many that Jesus refers to and the disciples and, and um, many of, the, of God's people in the New Testament. You see them referring to the Old Testament. So this is one of those stories. Jesus himself referred to the story of Jonah. And he said, the men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Noah. And indeed, a greater than Noah is here. Jesus was saying, I'm here in the generation of his day and I'm preaching and there are people who are rejecting me. But way back in Jonah's time, Jonah was preaching and people accepted him. While I, who am greater than Jonah, am being rejected. He makes quite a few comparisons just in this text. Another point that's brought out, it's not really major to this lesson, but to us today who have some beliefs about um, you know, many things, but look at what he says here. The men of Geneva, of Nineveh will rise in the judgment. So you know how some, um, even Christians, especially Christians, um, believe that when people die, they go directly to heaven. And the Bible teaches in so many places that first of all, heaven wasn't guaranteed until Jesus fulfilled his mission because of what Satan did with Adam and Eve. People lost um, that eternal life, but God promised that it would be restored through Jesus. And it wasn't until Jesus died on the cross and rose that the promise of eternal life was fulfilled. The people of Nineveh weren't in heaven yet, and they were good people after their repentance. And Jesus says that they will rise in the judgment. You know, we believe the dead in Christ will rise first when Jesus comes. They're already in heaven. How, how are they gonna rise? and even these people of Nineveh. So that's just kind of an aside from this lesson. But when I see unique doctrines that so many people either don't know or don't accept, when I see it, I like to um, point it out. And this lesson now does tell us what the overall objective is. This week, let's look at Jonah and what we can learn from his restlessness and lack of peace. Any, any questions about this overview before we get into the lesson? Any questions? Any statements? Any comments? Huh? Maybe I was thinking yeah. that way back there with none of us, uh, none of us, Everybody didn't know the Bible. They weren't they right. teachers, so how can they, um, I mean, uh, how can they be charged with sin and stuff like that? It, mm -hmm. And it wasn't, no, you know, no teachers, are, I guess, you know, for them to, to learn. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't they be in heaven? Well, that's why memory verse said, these were people who couldn't discern their right hand from their left. Now, you know, literally they knew their left hand from the right. But, but didn't what, they have to be taught? I mean. I mean what is being said here is they, they had not been taught. Right. They had not been, they were ignorant people. And that's why they needed someone to go to them. But let me just say something about this whole idea of people being ignorant. Um, 
and it's not a part of this lesson, but since you brought it up, remember the world was destroyed by the flood and we only had Noah and his three sons. They knew God, they knew God. And so as they went their different ways and uh, we had generations being born, people didn't know a lot because it was passed down generation after generation. Now, sometimes the people themselves, the parents, the families, and even the society, they were so um, influenced by Satan that they stopped giving the information that they knew. But to think that they're totally ignorant, they did have some things and we know it because as you examine societies, as the archeologists look at stuff, as um, anthropologists and those who do that kind of deep study, um, the sociologists, they do find in places where Christianity was not born and where we're not aware of Christianity being spread, we do find that people knew things that we're surprised that they knew. But that's because everybody um, from the children of, of um, Noah, everybody knew something. And a lot of things did um, continue to be passed down. So, but we're told that these Ninevites were ignorant and their livestock, <laughs> or they had a lot of livestock. So that's a good point, I'm Doris. Okay, so um, we're not gonna do a lot with the story of Jonah because that's a story that most people know. I don't wanna take for granted that everybody knows because we have new believers and there are people who um, just heard on the news. I don't know why, was it the news or somewhere I read something just this week about some famous person who said they never read the Bible. I think it was, um, who's the husband of the singer? What can I think of her name? Um, Beyonce, who's her husband? Somebody, for some reason it was said that he said he never read the Bible. He never Maybe. read the Bible. Yeah, that was, that was said. He never read the Bible. So we cannot assume that everybody knows everything. But we're going to look at this runaway prophet. Can I make a quick comment, Carol? Yeah, go ahead. That's not quite unusual that... Um, that individual, oh, I'm machine is doing something. Marilyn, what are you saying? You're muted now. Can you unmute yourself and continue? When did something happen to a computer or what happened? Hmm. She's still muted. Marilyn, if you can hear us, you, you're muted. No, that's not. Okay, well, let's go on and maybe she'll, you know, she'll jump back in. Actually, it looks like she's gone. I don't know what happened. Okay, well, anyway, um, let's get into Jonah. Jonah was a missionary in Israel. He was a prophet. He spread God's word around Israel, from different parts of Israel. But God wanted him to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was not far, um, but they were a wicked people, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Why why he didn't want to go? And you know what? That was new to me. That was really new to me in this lesson. Um, we were always so fascinated by him getting swallowed by a whale, by him changing his mind, and the other aspects of the story. 
But here's a missionary, a prophet, who God asked him to go someplace. And he literally says in his heart and mind to God, no. He says, no, I'm not going. I mean, he, he says it by his body language. He says it by what he does. And so he sets off in the opposite direction to where God called him. He didn't even stop to reason with God as had some other Bible prophets. You know, remember the story of, of, um, no, of uh, Moses. Moses didn't want to do what God asked him to do. But he, and he said, well, God, you know, are you sure? Do, and, and um, you know, I don't even speak well. And, and I think, who's going to listen to me? So he had this discussion with God. Remember that? And even... But uh, don't, don't we, don't many of us and religious people too, um, do the same thing? We don't say the words, but we just don't go. Well, that's what Jonah was. He didn't even talk to God. He just didn't go. And, um, you know, I, I had a map that I saved and I was trying to figure out, how can I show you this map? And somehow I accidentally deleted it. But I looked at the map of where Jonah was, where he was in Israel. Israel, from Israel to Nineveh, he needed to travel east. Nineveh today would be where um, Iraq is. It would be over there. And so it's still a part of the Middle East from, from Israel today over to Iraq. It's not that, it's not so far. But he didn't go over to Nineveh. He went all the way over to the west. He traveled in the opposite direction. He was trying to get to Tarshish, which today would be Spain, all the way over to Europe. He was going 2,200 miles. He was going a long way. And, and the, the distance from Israel to Iraq, I'm not sure how many miles that is, but I don't even think it's a thousand miles. But from Israel over to Tarshish or going to Spain, 2,200 miles. He wasn't playing about, I'm not going. <laughs> he, he didn't try to, 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 to um, negotiate with God. He just said, no, I'm not going. And so he set off. Um, first going to Joppa, which is in that direction, and then he was going to have to um, probably transfer to get to, to um, I'm calling it Spain. So now we get to, oh, anything about that? Just not even talking to God, just going and going far. Okay, so now we get to why. This was really new to me. And what was most um, astonishing to me about myself was that I never even asked why. It never, it never came to my mind to say, why didn't he want to go? If God chose him to go, he must have had some, some decent qualities. There must have been something about him that was good and that was right. So did anybody else ever wonder or did you already know? So why? Here's why. It tells us in a lesson. Historical and archaeological records document the cruelty of the Neo-Assyrian overlords who dominated the ancient Near East during the 8th century BC, the time that Noah ministered in Israel. About 75 years later, the Neo-Assyrian king Anekarib uh, attacked Judah. And we actually kind of studied that um, back when we were in Isaiah. 
um, Anakarib attacked Judah. He attacked Israel. He attacked Samaria. And they had already fallen years earlier. And King Hezekiah, we actually studied this, apparently had joined a local anti-Assyrian coalition. But when we were studying it at the time, the city of Nineveh was not um, identified. So these were a people who the world, the known world of, of Jonah's time, they feared those Ninevites. These were people who had already proven that they were bad boys. Historically, historical Assyrian documents and the wall reliefs of Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh all tell us the cruel story about the fall of Lachish, one of the most important and well-fortified southern border fortresses of Hezekiah. In one inscription, Sennacherib claims to have taken more than 200,000 prisoners from 46 fortified cities that he claimed to have destroyed. When the Assyrian king took um, Lachish hundreds of thousands of prisoners these prisoners were impaled. Um, impaled means they were pierced. They were, um, you know how Jesus was pierced in the side, but they were just, they were stabbed all over. That's uh, how they were impaled. Hardcore supporters of King Hezekiah were flayed alive. And when you're flayed, your skin is removed. Now, sometimes the skin, they would just skin people, but sometimes they beat them so much and they um, attack them in different ways that their skin came off. Mm -hmm. This is how cruel these Ninevites were. And then some people were just sent to slave labor. So now I can see uh, why... Um, Jonah did not want to go. The Assyrians could be incredibly cruel, even by the standards of the world in their time. I mean, a lot of people were cruel. They did all kinds of things. But even in their day, the people said, oh, no, these are some cruel people. And here God was sending Jonah into the very heart of this empire. So that answers my question that I never even thought to ask. <laughs> but um, now I know we got so caught up in the, the drama and how astonishing it is. That first of all, he was going so far away. And how can um, he dare say no to God? Yeah. Go ahead, Marilyn. You disappeared on us. So we went ahead. I know. My machine decided to do a Windows update right in the middle. <laughs> so I'm on my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what I was going to say, and I know this is way back, I mean, a few minutes back. Mm -hmm. um, it's not unusual not to have never, ever read the Bible until, um, because I grew up as a Catholic, and there were tons <laughs> of Catholics in our country, and we never read the Bible. Thank so I <laughs> started reading the Bible when I started taking lessons lesson <laughs> studies from for the from the Adventist church so it's not an unusual thing you okay. know <laughs> even today <laughs> huh? even today right yeah. so what I was going to say about um Jonah it appears the lesson brought out that Jonah had been called to speak for God before and he did but in this situation based on what you described what was going on he became fearful yeah. and decided to run away and you know it's going to come out in the lesson as we come a little more not only was he fearful he didn't like these people you know when you think of you know i think of us who do we especially as black people you know we have a hard time embracing white supremacists 
you know, um, and they're the people who are today. This is the day. They're supposed to be at the Capitol today. Yes, that's right. They don't call themselves white supremacists. They say white nationalists, that they believe in America. They don't want America to be weak, but we know who they are, the, the KKK mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and, and Proud Boys and all, and those groups. Well, you know, um, some people fear them, but today a lot of people just dislike them. And we look at so many people that 45 embraced and 45 himself, he didn't endear himself and his people didn't endear themselves to us. And so when I think of, um, and look at this question because it ties in, you know, fleeing from God, have you ever done that before? If so, how well did it work for you? And what lessons should you have learned from that mistake? Now, if we were called to go into the heart of the KKK, hmm. to go to somebody who's like that, you know, would we want to go? Even though we might fear them, we may not fear them, but we don't even like them. You know how God says, um, love your enemies? And we could say, well, I'd love them that if I found a person who was a KKK member who was really um, down and out, who needed my help, who needed some money, I'd probably give it because, you know, I love people, but we don't like them. And we sure <laughs> want to go. You know, I, I can understand better. Yeah, I can understand better. So have we ever done that? Have we ever done it before? And how did it work for us? Hmm. Let's go on. <laughs> so, um, oh, something else that I wanted to, to bring out before we move on about Nineveh, because I was looking at that this, in their day, this was considered a big city. And in their day, this was considered a lot of people. So I was trying to um, do some research to find out, well, how big was it? And how many people were there? And um, found out that in Nineveh at that time, their population was about 123,000 people. Yes. So to understand <clears throat> what that means, um, the, the cities in our the city in our country that might be closest to it would be Berkeley, California. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been to Berkeley and I went all through California this summer, but we didn't stop in Berkeley. So the city in Maryland that I think is closest might be Columbia. So if you take all the people in Columbia, mm -hmm. Columbia isn't that large. Columbia is, is um, not 120 something, but maybe 108, 109. That's about the closest that I could find. So to give us an idea, and in that day, you know, that was, that was pretty big. Um, mm -hmm. That was a pretty big city. And then a lot of people, they've got a tremendous, mighty army. And then they're mean. They don't mind hurting people. They don't mind pulling your skin off piercing your body so so then uh, we know the story most of us but for those who may not while Jonah was on his way there was a terrible storm the sailors on the boat who were not um, they were not God's people they didn't know the one God but they did know that some deity was angry. They related this terrible storm to anger of a deity. And they were casting lots to see who was God angry with when Jonah confessed. It, I'm the one, God is angry with me, throw me overboard. And Jonah, when he's thrown overboard, Jonah is saved from a watery grave by God who orders a fish to save Jonah. 
it's in our lesson. Jonah is actually saved by being swallowed by a large fish. We say he swallowed, swallowed by a whale. And you know, I I did some research in that and say, has anybody else, is there any record anywhere of anybody being swallowed? Well, there have been. Plenty of people mm -hmm. have been swallowed yeah. by whales, but they have not survived. <laughs> Nobody has been thrown up. <laughs> but there's no record of anybody being spit out when whale's stomach gets upset because of this foreign food. <laughs> no, the whales or the fish or whoever went ahead and ate them and, and um, they were digested. <laughs> So while there are records of people being swallowed, there are fish and whales big enough to consume the whole person. There are no records of anybody ever surviving that. Uh, Carol, uh -huh. this, this year, it seems like there was a person who was swallowed by something, but he got spit out immediately. Oh, that happened this year? Uh, oh, but he didn't go. Or in the last year? He didn't go but down to his belly. Didn't go. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, he did. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, there have been some stories I know, um, fictional, where they've been bitten. Um, and, and we know people have been bitten or they've lost a limb, but mm -hmm. to have been digested. Okay, but good, but um, I haven't heard that one in, in my search. I didn't see that, but thank you. Yeah, it was so, on the news, and he, he didn't go in very far, but he immediately got thrown out, and he was glad of that. Okay. But he so did they, did they call him Jonah? <laughs> did he, was he named Jonah? <laughs> um, I, I don't remember them calling him that. <laughs> they probably okay. thought of the story. Jonah is, um, he's forced into a three-day rest. Now, see, I'm I'm just wondering if the if the um, editors or the authors of the story took some liberty here. I mean, I just can't imagine that Jonah was at rest physically. I mean, where did he get a pillow and, and his body rest? And and, on the teeth. <laughs> and then we we're going to read his prayer. Um, was he really at peace? Was he? But anyway, during this time in the, in the belly of this big fish, he realizes how very dependent he is on God. Sometimes we have to be brought to the place where we don't have anything that this world offers to lean on in order to realize that Jesus is who we really need. And sometimes when we come to that, I don't know if I would call it we're at peace, but we certainly are at a place where we come to, we come to our senses and we realize if we ever knew God. But you know, there were people who um who aren't uh, confessed religious people, but there are times um, people say. Uh, in wars. There are no atheists in wars. There are no atheists. You get into places where people call out to God, even though they never knew him, they call out to him. So this is where we are sometimes, and this is where Jonah was. So now while he was there, we're going to read his prayer. What was he saying um, to God during this time? And um, um, Miss Miss Letty, can you read Jonah's prayer? It's in Jonah two, G, uh, the book of Jonah, verse two, and verses one through nine. And that's what we want to know. What was he talking about? Was he really resting? Was he at peace? Let's see. Did he did he come to his senses and realize if I'm going to have any peace, it's got to be in God? Miss Letty, are you on your way there? Oh, okay. Is Jonah two one to nine? Yes. 
From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depth, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your body, toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for, for them. But I, will, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Okay. He, he remembered the things that he already knew. And when it says he turned to the sanctuary, he, in their day, remember when God told him to build that sanctuary years ago? It was so that I may be with you. And so um, his turning to the sanctuary, he's not just thinking about the building, but he's thinking this is where God is with us. I'm turning to God. And he's realizing that his only safety for him and, and of course for us is to seek God and to seek his will. Now, when you hear his prayer, I, I don't get the, for me, I don't get the impression he's at peace, but I do get the impression that he realizes the only hope I have is to go back to God and do his will. And, and Lord, I'm, I'm going to do it if I'm saved. If you save me from this, I'm going to do it. Okay. Um, it's a question here. How might stepping out of your normal environment allow you to look at it from a new and perhaps a needed perspective? Are there things that we need to look at that maybe God wants us to do that you know, we've run away from or we haven't really considered? Are there burdens for people? Are there burdens for family members that maybe God is calling us um, that we need to look at? Perhaps in a new and needed perspective. Okay, let's go on. Mission accomplished. This is, the, to me, the funny part of the story. Where the wicked people, he, Jonah goes to Nineveh. He goes. He just goes ahead and he does what God asked him to do. And it sounds like his sermon is pretty short. We don't get all of what he might have said. But it sounds like he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all we get. And that, that was the point of his message. So the details aren't given, but we know he said that. And um, I get, well, we know from the rest of the story that Jonah goes ahead. He gives this, but it doesn't, but his heart really isn't in it. He still doesn't like those people. And he's not anxious for them to be saved, but he follows the command of God to him. God says, do this, so he does it. He didn't do it wholeheartedly. But the people of Nineveh, they have receptive ears. And they believe Jonah's words of warning, even though his heart wasn't in it, but his words were there and they believed it. Now, it says everyone, including animals, had to fast 
And it says here has to fast and mourn. Now we don't know how animals mourn, except we know how they can fast because the owner of the animal or the master of the animal or the caregiver um, can keep the animals from eating. You cannot feed the animal. Now, maybe that's how they're mourning <laughs> because they want some food. That could be it. But everyone, everybody, included the animals, they fasted, they mourn, they, um, they clothed the king and, and Ninevites. They clothed themselves in sackcloth. And um, sackcloth, from my understanding, is very uncomfortable. It's, it's very coarse. It's yeah. the coarse. Yeah. Dirty. <laughs> uh, well, didn't the Lord really have to be with them? Because when animals get hungry, they eat people. They eat anything or oh, anybody, you know. So uh, since the animals were fasting, it was pretty rough. I thought that mm -hmm. the Lord had to be intervening there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm thinking about the, the animals that they would have had as their, um, as the animals that they were farming or raising you know, for agriculture, most of those animals, like cows and sheep, and now goats will eat anything, but cows are vegetarian. And so I don't know if they would eat um, any people, even if they're hungry, and, and sheep, I don't know if the, they would eat any people. Now the goats would. Doris, you're muted. They, they are in the field. They are in the field. How could, can you stop them from eating grass? they might have herded them into a place because they can herd them. You know how the shepherds can bring them together right, and right in the barn. That's what I'm thinking. They may have herded them in and kept them away from their food. But anyway, it says um, three places, four texts we wanna look at. Um, we've already read most of Jonah, but let's look at somebody will take Jonah three, six through nine, Somebody else, and please let me know you're taking, who's going to take Jonah 3, 6 through 9? Okay, I, I get that. Jonah 3, 6 through 9, I get that. Somebody else, who can take Jeremiah 25, 5? Somebody, quickly. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Uh, which one is it? Jeremiah 25, 5. Okay, do we have somebody who'll take Ezekiel 14, 6? Ezekiel 14, 6. Can somebody take that? I'll take it. Okay, and then the last one. Revelation 20. Uh, <laughs> Revelation, Revelation 2, 5. Is there someone who can take that? Revelation 2, 5. Somebody else? Just my. Okay, you'll take that one too? Because I'll get it after. I... Okay. Yes. So let's go with Jonah 3. Now we're going to compare these and see what elements were involved in the king's speech, which show that he understands what true repentance is all about. That's what we're looking at. True repentance. Okay, go ahead with Jonah three, six through nine. Okay, all right. For the word came into the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published, though Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles said saying let none let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let the man and the beast be covered with sackcloth and crying mightily unto god yea let them turn everyone from his evil way 
and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn the turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Okay, now let's compare. He's saying we're going to turn away from our, our wicked ways. We're going to do it. And, and we don't, who knows if God is going to change his plans, but we're going to turn away. So let's compare what he's saying to Jeremiah 25, 5. They said, turn now each of you from your evil ways and your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors forever and ever. Okay. So Jeremiah is warning the Israelites back at some point that they needed to turn from their evil ways. Don't just say it. Don't just ask, Lord, forgive me, but turn away from it. Uh, Ezekiel 14, 6. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. In Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Okay. So God, he's, he uses the word repent. He asks us to repent. But, you know, we say so often in our prayers, forgive us, just forget. We say it. But the real, real repentance isn't just asking for forgiveness, which we do every day. All of our prayers say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yes, yeah. As we forgive our debt, as we say it. But true repentance in all of these um, verses is not just what you say, it's what you do, how you act. And you can't do an act unless you really mean it. It has to come from your heart. So, um, anything else about comparing those verses? Anything else? Okay. Why is repentance such a crucial part of the Christian experience? Why is it such a crucial part? Because we commit the same things over and over. You enjoy and you, your sin. Because <laughs> we enjoy it. <laughs> okay. You must we, really, you have to really like it or, you know, be enjoying it because otherwise you wouldn't, you know. And I thought that, uh, I, uh, I thought that God doesn't, force us to do things that, you know, it, uh, he just says, the, uh, if we don't repent, what will really happen? But still, you have to be the one who really want to get better or do better because he's make you do it. Right. But he can help us because, you know, as the text that says, for it is God who works in us both to will and to, and to do. So we have to pray to God to give us the willingness that, you know, I really like this. Take, take, take the good taste of it away. And people have addictions um, to drugs, to alcohol, to sex, to, to food, to all kinds of things. And we know from, from psychology today, that once we're addicted, we, we might even want to, we might even have the will. We, we're saying it and we really mean it. I don't want to do this, but it is so, so, so difficult. We're, we are so weak. And that's when we need God to give us the will, but also show us the way and be with us. Now, if we ask for forgiveness and we say, Lord, I'm repenting, I'm turning, 
And then we fall into that same trap again. Does God continue to forgive us? What do you think? Well, he said to forgive, was it 70 times seven or something? So he must do that also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We are to forgive each other unlimitlessly because that 70 times seven does not mean write it down. And when you get to that, what, 7,000 or whatever, um, <laughs> then you can stop. I can give us it up. I can stop right then. Yeah. He I means. That's my point. Now that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So he means that we don't, we don't stop forgiving. And so uh, I believe like you, Letty, that, um, but he knows our heart. God knows our heart. He knows when we're just saying it because it's a part of the prayer we've memorized. And when we really want to turn away, we really want to do better. And we do, and we want to um, develop new habits, do things differently. Um, and, and we and psychologists have taught us that the way that you get over a bad habit, and of course, addictions, you might need professional help, but you replace it by another habit. And when you replace an old habit with a new one, that's when um, you actually can get over it. And so when you repent, Lord, help me to stop doing this, then do something else in its place that's better and more godly. Any questions about that or any thoughts on it? No, I was just saying that <clears throat> the Lord would really have to replace it because Whatever you, you keep repeating, you, you, it's a really a hard thing to give up. You know, you can't think of, at that time in your own, you can't think of anything that can replace that, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes that habit or, or that word you speak, it comes out so fast. Before, <laughs> and then you think about it. Oh, I should have said, oh, I shouldn't have said it or, or I shouldn't have done that. Um, and we have to ha ask God to help us. And we're so quick on the trigger because of the habits um, that we have to work on. Now, let's go back to Jonah, though. He did what God said. <laughs> and then he was angry <laughs> because the people repented. So what was he angry about? Jonah is worried about looking foolish. <laughs> he behaves like a toddler having a temper tantrum. Because God actually accepted the repentance, the the um, the words of the and the and the behaviors of the Ninevites, and they weren't going to suffer the consequences because they repented. I'm trying to rush through because I'm looking at the time, and I want to give you time to bring out things that I may have overlooked. And plus, there's some questions on Friday that I want to get to. I didn't want to go there first, um, as I do sometimes, because I thought there were some good points through each day. So, but at the end of Wednesday, um, we're told in this, in this um, note that God so loved the world, not just the Hebrews, not just the Israelites. And that was a thing that was hard for Jonah. God so loved the world, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it doesn't have to be just Seventh-day Adventists. It doesn't have to be just Christians. God loves the world. Should um, I not pity Nineveh? That's what God says. That great city with all these people who don't know stuff, God, that's, that's where our memory verse comes from. How grateful we should be that in the end, God, and not we ourselves, is the ultimate judge of hearts and minds and motives. That's such a powerful um, passage and statement. How can we learn to have that kind of compassion and patience for others that God has? Or at least how can we learn to reflect that compassion and patience? And again, go back to people that, you know, we say we love everybody and we, 
we would be like the Good Samaritan, but think of people that we're afraid of and people who we know have done evil, people who we know right now are, now I don't know if they showed up, but they were scheduled to be at the Capitol today, who we know don't really care for people of different color skin. We know they don't. We know from how they behave. Can we learn to have compassion on them? If there's no response. I think it's easier for us than it is for them. Because, you know, we uh, more, I guess we've been depressed and everything so much. So we done got sort of used to that. But they are studying, want to do that. And even though we let them off or, you know, we have some compassion for them anyway, you know, but they're not used to uh, doing that at all. And it's much harder mm -hmm. to, you know, yeah. than it is for us because we've been doing it all our life. And you know what else I hear, Doris? Um, remember, I think it was last week's memory verse that we have so many examples. We have so many lessons in the Bible right? that we can learn from. So these things, things are recorded for us so that we know how to handle things that are difficult. And so we should be able to, to forgive and embrace right. 45 and his people. Now, are you saying... Everybody in Nineveh couldn't be bad. I mean, the whole world, <laughs> city. I mean, not unless they feared their life. You know, now nah, you know if I didn't do what you say do, you gonna kill me too. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that that you can't judge every single person right by, by the group they're in, yeah. and yeah. even us black people, as a matter of fact, wasn't the person who was scheduled to run for governor of, of California. Right. If they had um, decided, if the vote had come out in California this week yes. to, let, to, to let that governor go, wasn't the Republican who yes. seemed to be the most popular, a black man. Yeah. Very different from what you think most Black people are about. Yeah, he was something else. Yeah, so you can't uh, you can't yes. judge all Black people the same. Right. There are some who lean toward um, white nationalism. Right, and he's, and he's working for the dollar anyway. That's right. Some who embrace forty five. So we can't just treat all people or think everybody thinks alike. Okay, we're into the main points of Thursday's lesson. And Thursday was um, down too far. Thursday, a two-way street. So what's the two ways? What's the two-way street that's brought out? Two, when we look at this lesson, God, God is teaching us two things that happened in this lesson. God pursues a reluctant prophet. He knows that Jonah needed the missionary trip just as the Ninevites needed the missionary message. Two ways. Nineveh needed to change their ways, but Jonah needed to change his belief system. Yeah, his ways. Too. His heart needed changing. That's the, that's the two-way street. One way, the people of Nineveh. The other way, Jonah himself. Jonah needed to learn, as some of us, to be merciful to save others by snatching them from the fire. Now, when it says to save others, you know, we can't save people. 
people are saved by grace through their faith in the blood of Christ. So what does this actually say to us? That um, we need to be merciful and save others by snatching them from the fire. What does that mean? Can we save others? Well, I think it just means to present Christ to them and then they make the decision. We have a part to play in their salvation. So, because just like the Ninevites, they were ignorant. And just as was brought out um, by Doris and Marilyn Thorpe, some people don't know the Bible. They have not read it. They don't know it, even though so much is available. And so we have a part to play in their salvation by teaching, by being an example, by, by talking about our beliefs, our beliefs. Um, snatching them from the fire. If we see somebody is definitely headed toward the fire, we can snatch them out of that. We can, we can tell them something. Um, that's why, you know, our whole church, the whole reason for church is evangelism, that we're God's people. We are spreading his word. He, we are co-workers with him. And so, you know, we have that to do. Okay, getting time is running out. So before I go to these questions that I highlighted, um, is there anything somebody else wants to bring out that when you studied the lesson, you had a question about something or there was some, some concept, some, some thought that you said, you'd like to know what other people feel about this? Or you just like to share something that just hits you hard? Anybody? So well, I was thinking I had, that. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Arlette. Um, so I had two takeaways. So one, um, I've grown up knowing the story of Jonah, probably one of the first Bible stories I learned as a kid. And I even went to like a whole theatrical production of Jonah a few years ago where they had like a managed to have this whale floating <laughs> above the audience. It was amazing. However, this is the first time that I realized that Jonah being in the well was God's grace. Mommy. Even though I've studied this lesson probably several, the story several times throughout my life. Because um, it's usually presented yeah. when you're a kid, like Jonah being in the well is the punishment because you're stuck on how awful that must have been. <laughs> and your concept of death is not really there I'm as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the first time I was like, oh yeah, he did save him mm -hmm. <laughs> by being in the well. Um, so that was just the benefit of restudying lessons that you might think you already know because you could be missing something. And then the second takeaway I had was just that God's grace doesn't always look how we think it's going to look. It's not always a nice meat package. It could be a smelly well. Oh, yeah. He might be putting us into this position that we can't understand what good is being in this smelly, dirty, ugly place that surely I might die here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How 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 is that our salvation? That's thank you. Two good points. Someone else was trying to get in at the same time. Yeah, that's that's me. Yeah. Uh, I was the thinking other of the other artist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead, yeah. Miss Lenny. Uh huh. Um, that Jonah. I think might have been upset that these evil people were getting away with something. Sometimes we say we want these people to repent and we love them, but we still want to see a little bit of punishment. They deserved it. And mm. I think that might have been part of his motivation too. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a human, kind of a human instinct, or maybe we're so cut accustomed to evil that we do want to see people get their just deserves. You know, when people, when people go to court and they get off with life in prison, they're getting off with life. They deserve to be sent to the electric chair. 
You know, sometimes the thoughts, they were so, so bad that they need to be punished. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? No, I believe that uh, now some people that's in prison, I can, for, you know, a lifetime or something like that, I could see maybe they could be lenient somewhat, you know, not all the way, but that's somebody like the head, like the president. Do things, say anything, and so many things and lies, and you don't get nothing? Now, I mm -hmm. think something's wrong with that. You know, I, I, I can see if they just don't know. Mm -hmm. But he has all the ways of knowing. He got <clears throat> uh, people, you know, writing his speeches, doing everything for him, him you know, and, and he just don't do it and nobody gives him any kind of punishment. Punishment. I think that's something's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. so I think he should get something. <laughs> well, so- I'd like to slap him. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> we, we're, looking, we're looking at some things. I'm not saying we're looking forward to some things happening to- to some people who we think deserve to serve or be punished, but we, we're going to see what happens. We don't have a lot of time for any of these questions, um, but the first one and the fifth one go together. You know, um, how are we to understand this attitude on the part of Jonah? We've been talking about that. And then whatever good reasons Jonah had or thought he had for wanting to for not wanting to go to Nineveh, God had shown him how wrong he actually had been. What attitude might we have toward others that could reflect this same attitude that Jonah displayed? I think we've talked about that already. I think it's come out. Yeah, that we feel like, oh, they need some punishment. He did all this. Now, of course, sometimes we say, well, we can forgive and we can we're not going to really forget, but we can move on. But let's have some reparations. And reparations have been given. Um, they have been given to us Black people who go back to slavery. But reparations have been given to um, Japanese, to Indians. Um, it's up here saying, let's leave. Is um, um, Doris, can you give us a, a closing prayer as we leave the breakout room? OK. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all the things that we've heard today. May we apply it to our life. Thank the Lord God for all you do. Please forgive us for our sins and help us, Lord, as we go through your Holy Spirit. God, direct us on that straight and narrow path. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.